Poppy love is booming in the UK. So much energy! The demand for dogs has gone through the roof since the first lockdown. I was like, oh my god, that dog is sick. <laughs> we don't need a sofa, we need a dog. <laughs> and more owners are starting to breed their dogs for the first time. We're now going to do a semen analysis. But with so many of us wanting to buy puppies, the cost has shot up. The price on dogs is absolutely skyrocketed through the roof at the moment. It's crazy. And the spike in popularity of certain breeds has triggered some serious welfare concerns. I honestly, hand on heart, cannot think of one positive that comes out of doing something like this to the dog. My name's Fabian Rivers. I'm a big dog lover, a proud brummy, and when I'm not on a walk with my dog Jackson, you can find me at my vet clinic. I'm seeing a worrying rise in serious health issues in some of Britain's most popular breeds. Bullies, Frenchies and Dachshunds. So you've got these short legs, this long back, and so that puts them at risk of, of back problems and that's what they're famous for. These complications are definitely getting worse and that's got me worried. So why are more people owning and breeding these dogs? What exactly are the risks and what can be done to reduce them? As I try to find out, I make some shocking discoveries about barbaric ear cropping procedures being carried out on puppies bought in Britain and uncover unlawful breeding practices being taught to amateurs. Absolutely illegal. That's breaking all sorts of laws. Finally, I take my findings to the government's top vet to see what more can be done to protect our beloved dogs. <laughs> A million dogs are bought each year in Britain, but during the pandemic, many more puppies than usual found a new home. Prices have skyrocketed, with bullies, Frenchies and Dachshunds commanding some of the, the largest increases. There are bully puppies here going for anything from £1,000 to £12,000. There is a Frenchie in front of me for £30,000. £30,000 is a house deposit for so many people, it is boggling to think someone would be willing to spend £30,000 for one pup. And these eye-watering prices don't seem to have dented their popularity with dog enthusiasts. I'm making just a quick cursory look on social media and there are thousands of groups. The Great British Bulldog Group, 111,000 different members. Daxon Love, 178,390 posts a day. Wow. There are just countless posts. It's its own social phenomena. But it's not just online that love for these dogs is booming. For owners of bullies, face-to-face -face meetings are also really popular. This is a whole new world to me. I deal with animals on a day-to-day -day basis and I had no clue about these gatherings of dog lovers. Bully breeds are all descendants of the ancient Greek molluscs. This term covers everything from Boston Terriers to American bullies. So what is it about these dogs that has their owners so hooked? Oh my gosh, Hi. hello. Hi. Hi, baby, all right. I'm so happy that everyone's come down today. It's a good little link up. <laughs> the thing is, his mum is blue. Oh, really? His mum is a blue pocket, yeah. So you guys love dogs? Absolutely love dogs. They're my life. <laughs> They're basically part of the family now. Um, they've helped really a lot with my mental health uh, through lockdown. And just to create like where I want to be, like find out who I really am really, so yeah. And so you've always been kind of dog lovers? I've always been a dog person. Dogs are awesome. Dogs are better than people. 
They are. You, you, they are. <laughs> dogs are definitely better than people. What is it about the bully meat that you love so much? Um, I think it's the community and everyone is like sharing quite their views. Like-minded people, aren't they? Good yeah, ones. like-minded people. Get to know some dogs, see some people, and get some new clients. I've just opened my new fertility clinic, so. For me, I love the fact that the entire community will come together. And don't get me wrong, there will not be every single bully owner, but a lot of people will come through to the meets. It's all about networking, chatting to people, meeting people. So I'm um, a creative filmmaker. I thought, okay, like let's let's try and transfer the skills that I've got, and you know, try and explore and experiment with my creativity, but with the bullies. And so you do shoots as well, yeah, things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if I join? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. We'd love to have you on a shoot. Yeah, thank you. Come so and much. check it out. Yeah. It's interesting these owners are not just building their social lives around their dogs, but are also looking to build their work lives around them too. Promoting your dogs online seems to be such a big part of these breeds. So I've come back to Manchester to meet Rosie and find out more. Hi, you all right? I'm good, thank you. You're good. I'm just going to stay out of your way, okay? That's all right. Wow. The first time I saw a bully was on social media and I was like, oh my God, what is that dog? That dog is sick. <laughs> you know? Started doing it in 2019. Photographs, video content, promo. There's a demand for it. There's a demand for it, and mm. everyone's got the money. These dogs mm. are not cheap. If you're making 60k in a litter, what's 200, 300 pounds for a shoot? And, to people are, your... and people are making that much. Oh, yeah. People are making, yeah. People are driving rangers and that from the, the litters. From, from, yeah. from litters. Yeah. So many people from the US have got these. Yeah. Go online, you see these dogs. And you know, you see all the celebrities with them, everyone in America's got them, they're in all the rappers' music videos. I don't really get a demand to shoot spaniels or boxes or, you know, Labradors or whatever. Labradors, mm. no. But, um, and that's because it's tied to social media. Social media yeah. and it's tied to people making money. It's so the hashtags, if you look at all the hashtags, it's thousands and thou hundreds of thousands of people using them hashtags. Mm. People will put on their Instagram, oh, I got the first pick. And I never knew this, but then when I clocked how much it's, it is the first pick, it's a it's, status it's thing. A thing isn't I it? got the first pick, I just put 25 bags on it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's a status thing. I just think not encouraging everyone to be a breeder is the main thing because I think that's where it's heading right now. There's a lot of people that don't know what they're doing, they're not providing the right care for the dogs, the dogs are dying, people are having entire litters die yeah. because they just don't know what they're doing. I can't knock someone who's who's committed to mixing animals and their other skills. I mean, that's what I do. She was just very, very clear about how she saw the world, and I really appreciated that. But if it's true there's been a boom in inexperienced breeders, I can't help but worry about the impact on dogs. Animal welfare law has been tightened recently to crack down on puppy farms. Puppies now have to be sold with their mother present and no one other than the breeder can sell puppies under the age of six months. But welfare charities say despite Lucy's law, they've recently seen a rise in puppies born in poor conditions and believe it's a result of people starting to breed for profit and the animal welfare problems fueled by the puppy boom aren't just homegrown. I know there's been a huge increase of importation of dogs recently in the UK. I think it's probably fueled by the demand for a variety of different breeds. I think the best place to have this conversation would be the Dogs Trust. Claire Wilson-Leary has invited me down to talk about some of the problems they're seeing. What's been going on? Recently, the demand for dogs in the UK has definitely skyrocketed. Yeah. And demand in particular for what we'd call popular breeds has always been very high. So French Bulldogs, Dachshunds, English mm -hmm. Bulldogs. These puppies tend to be bred in Central and Eastern Europe in quite poor conditions. Right. 
Um, they're then transported on really long journeys across Europe, thousands of miles with no food at all we've seen, mm -hmm. very little water, no exercise or toilet breaks. Quite often these puppies will be imported with false documentation. Right. So our investigations have found evidence of vets in Central and Eastern Europe falsifying the information on passports to make the puppies look older than they are, right. to make them look like they've had the vaccinations that they should have done. So there's no limit to how far some of these breeders will go to get these dogs in. Yeah. And, and that's just heartbreaking, really. It is, yeah. Mm. To avoid unscrupulous breeders and sellers, prospective owners really need to know who they're buying their new puppy from. According to a study by the Dogs Trust, more than a third of new dog owners did absolutely no research before buying their new dog. If I'm going to understand why and what choices people are making, I think I need to hear firsthand from someone who's looking for a new furry friend. I'm meeting Aaron and Freya. They want a new puppy, but are keen to get all the facts before taking the plunge. So what are you looking for in particular? We're looking at Dachshunds particularly. Why was Dachshund the, the dog for you? I first heard of the breed when I was quite young. Mm. I watched a film that was actually called The Ugly Dachshund, which was about a Great Dane who thinks He's a sausage dog. So that was where I first sort of <laughs> fell in love with the breed when I was quite young. Where did this all start? For you, it was pretty much as soon as we moved out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Before we'd even unpacked. Yeah. Just bought <laughs> a house, it was like, oh, cool. we don't need a sofa, we need a dog. <laughs> we need a dog. <laughs> so you've done some research. Yeah. How's that going? Yeah. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> not convinced. <laughs> I feel like I've done a little bit more than you. Yeah, definitely. I do it more than I yeah. myself. I'm guessing you're spending, we're looking at thousands of pounds. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. For a dog. <laughs> how, how, how many thousands do you so, know? For a Dachshund airport, you're looking between two and three thousand. Mm. That's uh, quite a big outgoing before you've even actually. Yeah. <laughs> got a dog. Dog. You do get the odd one. Yeah. It's cheaper, but. We find that a bit weird, like why yeah. are they cheaper? Even though it's the low prices like, are a bit concerning mm. sometimes, the high prices can be as well. Mm. You just think, well, they're in it for the money. So I bet they don't care that much about the dogs. It's hard so, to yeah. know. It's hard to know, that's it. It's hard to know. And that's where you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna help you guys uh, learn a little bit more about making the decision. Fab, thank right. you. <laughs> There are a couple of people I think it would be great for Aaron and Freya to meet. The first is Sam Gaines from the RSPCA. She's the perfect person to make sure they don't fall foul of bad breeders. So what would you say your main bits of advice, like your top tips for people in our situation looking to buy a puppy? So when it comes to adverts, there are a few things that you can do. You can copy and paste the details of the seller and put them into your search engine. Big red flags if you end up with someone that's popping up time and time again, or if they're associated with two or three breeds. That's generally an indication that it's someone who is acting irresponsibly. Also, if you've got a puppy that is being advertised at younger than 15 weeks, but they're stating that that puppy's got a passport and maybe it's vaccinations, again, big, big red flag, because it's actually illegal to import puppies into the UK until they're over 15 weeks of age. Any breeder that is selling you a puppy should be as keen to make sure that their puppy is going to a good home as you are to get information from them. You know, you should be feeling really, really comfortable yeah. and actually being encouraged to ask lots and lots of information. Making sure that mum's there when you visit, that you are going to the place where the pups were born, that they're not asking you to meet them halfway, yeah. or will you hand over cash now? These are all things that, you know, are real warning signs. We would strongly advocate that you use a document that's called the Puppy Contract, which is an online tool to give you assurance that the puppy that you're going to buy has had the best start to life. Mm -hmm. 
And have you thought about rescuing? We have a lot, actually. Um, we've looked for quite a few months with not yeah. much luck. So, you know, you do need to be patient because there are dogs out there. And the other thing to just remember as well is that there's breed rescue clubs. So there, there will be rescue clubs for, um, for Dachshunds as well. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. I'm a huge fan of rescuing, but on average, the UK has less than 150,000 dogs available each year to adopt or foster, and demand for puppies is many times more than that. If you decide to buy a puppy, animal welfare organisations recommend it's best to get one from a responsible breeder. I'm really interested in seeing what turns your average owner into a breeder. So right now I'm on my way to meet someone who's made that transition from owner to breeder and has had a litter of nine pups. I'm visiting 21-year-old Hayden from Lancashire. Hello! He has a male American bully called Silver and a female old English bulldog called Grace. Hayden mated Grace with a local stud dog, Chico, and six weeks ago, she gave birth to a huge litter of 12 puppies. So this is your first entrance into breeding world, is that, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Tell me how this all started. Um, so we set up the social media page on Instagram for Silver. Mm -hmm. uh, that was literally just to post the pictures, all the best pictures that we had of him, and it started flying. We got like nearly, a thousand to twelve hundred followers in the first week just from setting it up. Wow. Um, we found out about the bully meets. That was a totally new thing to me. Like I didn't even know these existed or what they were. Everyone was coming up to us saying how good the dogs were and the asked look. if we were breeding them and stuff like that. So what happened at the meets that made that light bulb moment go off? Um, it's just the attention that both both the dogs were getting. Um, to me, Grace was just a normal bulldog, but when we go there, everyone loves her. Like, they yeah. lie on the floor, they stroke her, and mm -hmm. it's more about seeing what they can produce more than anything. So, the fun part. Give me a blow-by-blow blow breakdown of the whelping. I just got home from work. I was sat upstairs in just my underwear after my shower, and then my nan shouted, saying, right, the first pup's here, and then it was just panic from there, really. It was the first time I'd actually been through the birthing section, and when they come out in, like, the bags and stuff like that, making sure they're out of the bag in time, and that they're breathing, and that Grace actually accepts the pup. She had 12 originally, but we lost three. That was heartbreaking for me. We tried everything, put them in an incubator and bottle fed, but it just wasn't meant to be. It was 12 hours, so that was a long period after a hard day at work as well. If my granddad weren't there, it would have been a completely different story. Really? And I don't think it would have gone as smooth as it actually did because mm. he's got so much experience mm. in the past of the breeding. A lot of people just think it's as easy as putting two dogs together, wait eight weeks, and it's as simple as that. It is not. There's a lot of hours that go into it. Out of 10, 10 being the hardest, one being the easiest thing you've ever done. Where on the scale? Strong 11. <laughs> Strong 11. Hayden intends to keep two of the puppies, has promised five to family and friends, and is selling the remaining two to people in the bully community. Would you say you're a, a, a breeder now, or? I wouldn't class myself as a breeder. The Grace won't be getting used again for breeding. That was just a one-off, that on mm. her. Give her the rest that she needs. Oh, yes. No. So, Silver's ears are cropped. Was that part of a decision or...? Uh, it was already done um, mm. when we went to buy him. We had no say in that. Do you think ear cropping is going to become more popular? Within the next five to ten years, I don't think there'll be any. The, the hype of that around the cropping would have died down and people will see that it's not all about how they look, it's the actual dog itself. So none of these little babies are going to be... No, these are all going to be keeping their ears, yeah, for absolutely. sure. absolutely. They're going to be big, aren't they? Yeah, they're going to be... Like, she's the smallest one there, mm -hmm. on the floor. And then this one is the absolute... Chunkiest. He's huge. <laughs> look at that chunk! 
<laughs> you are so chunky. He's going to be a big one. Mm, chunky, 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 chunky. Mm. So many lovely puppies in there. So. I just had a, a really nice time talking to him. Um, what it was nice, however, to, to hear from him is that it wasn't easy. And if it wasn't for his granddad, who had a long history and is quite experienced in this breeding field, he might have found it a little bit more difficult. I also hope Hayden is right and ear cropping is going out of fashion. I make no secret of the fact that I'm completely against this practice, but it's a huge issue for certain breeds. Cropping became unlawful in the UK in 1895 and is also illegal across most of Europe. But despite it being against the law, this practice is still going on. Dogs ears are being dangerously cut off and stitched up, often without pain relief. This usually happens when puppies are only six to 12 weeks old. Some people struggle to recognize when dog's ears have been cropped, often thinking there are two types of Dobermans, one with sticky up ears, one without, when actually the pointed ear look is being callously created through a painful operation. Are you gonna come help me? Hmm? <laughs> All right. Crop deer dogs are all over social media platforms. Lots of these dogs are being shown on social media by so many different people in society. And it's starting to create this image that this is normal. One person in particular that received a huge amount of heat was Jordan Banjo. Jordan bought a six month old dog whose ears had already been cropped and posted a picture of him on social media. The kickback from it was, was quite intense. And so he released this, this statement talking about him not being aware. Hey guys, so I'm getting so many DMs about Sergio and his ears. I can't pretend to have known all of the information on cropped ears. I don't even want to pretend to be misinformed. To be blunt, I literally didn't even think about it in the first instance. Definitely wish his ears had been left, but he's my dog now. Not really sure what else I can say apart from, I appreciate the messages and advice. It's clear from this statement that people do not know what ear cropping entails. They don't know that it means mutilation. They don't know the legal side of it. And so whether it's a celebrity or your mate from across the road, everyone seems to be caught up in not knowing what is happening. What's the truth? There are a lot of myths around the so-called health benefits of ear cropping. But as far as the veterinary and welfare community are concerned, all of these claims are completely unfounded. Someone who knows this all too well is Anna from the RSPCA. Hello, Eton. Tell me a little bit about Eton. He's a big, he's like a horse, isn't he? He is. I mean, more like a lion, actually. Um, <laughs> Eton's about four and a half, five. Right. He was one of a litter of puppies that were sent down um, from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. They were part of an investigation mm -hmm. over a number of dogs that have had their ears cropped. Has it affected him? Yeah, has. he is very wary of anyone going around his head right. and around his ears. Um, he's also now, because he looks quite intimidating, people mm -hmm. tend to back away from him. Mm. He picks up that signal from mm -hmm. them and then he reacts differently towards them than he would do if they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And it's sad because he's so gentle yeah. and yet something that we've done to him has had such a long lasting effect that makes him come across as not being gentle. To me, to want to actually alter something's appearance, to take it away from how it should look naturally is just an abhorrent thing to do. Mm. Welfare experts also warn that ear cropping removes one of the important ways dogs communicate with each other. Despite all this, the RSPCA has seen the number of cases brought to their attention jump by over 600% in the last six years. When it comes to ear cropping, it is an issue. It is problematic and we need to address it. Our 
Sharon and Freya are in South Yorkshire. They want to find out more about adopting a Dachshund. Jamie works with a Dachshund rescue organisation, the Red Foundation. Is there anything particularly about the Dachshund breed that maybe people doesn't realise getting into it and then that could possibly lead to issues and maybe reasons why people end up giving them on? I think people not doing the research um, on them, not putting in the time and the effort with the training, so then that can also cause the behavioural problems with them babyfying them too much and thinking, oh, we can't leave um, the dog at all. It's not actually doing them the best favours, so because then that causes a separation anxiety, which is then another issue in itself. A lot of people see Dachshunds as handbag dogs, easy to scoop up, you know, and you're thinking that you're protecting them from the world, but actually they will think, that they're protecting you, which then can cause issues. They are quite possessive dogs, which can then obviously lead to it coming out in aggression towards strangers. So you really do have to be prepared for the, so the responsibility, because it sounds like from everything you've said, it's these like bad behaviours that people give their dogs up for. Yeah, is actually de de definitely. By, but as yes. long as you guys put the effort yeah. into the dog, they make absolutely amazing pets. After meeting Hayden earlier, I'm keen to find out more about first-time breeders. The huge demand for dogs has led many owners to take the plunge, but it's not all smooth sailing. I'm driving to Yorkshire to meet an owner who recently decided to breed her dog for the first time, but I've heard nothing went to plan. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Come on in. Oh, oh. hello, sweetheart. Who this is, is Ginny. This? Hello, Ginny. Oh, you're going to give me a paw. She's a good girl. This all, one? All for She's the treats, a good right? Girl. So, you recently have made a decision about breeding her, is that mm -hmm. correct? Last year. Where did the idea come from? We did it for three reasons, really. Um, it, would be, it would be good for her to have one litter. If we made some money, brilliant. And because I said if we're all going to get locked up, we might as well get locked up with a load of puppies and have some fun. And what was the first step? So I, w I looked for a stud, so we had our mating window and um, and she got mated twice in that week and, and she didn't get pregnant. So what did you do after that? So what we did was cried for a few days, <laughs> then got over it and then said, um, well, we'll try again. We took her back over and she did conceive. So I took her on week seven and, you know, the vets down there, they just love her and they were like, we're so excited, she's pregnant. But they could only see one fetus. We're normally seeing, you know, at least four. Yeah. And how did you feel about that? You'd finally got what you'd wanted mm. and you had one. So how did you, how, what, what was the feeling at that point? Well, I was thrilled. My husband, not so much because he wanted some dollar, you know, but I was absolutely overjoyed that my baby was pregnant and everybody was healthy. What happened next? So um, she went into labour, so I rang the vets. They just said, look, my concern is on the last scan, there was one fetus, and if she's got one pup, he's going to have a big head, and it's her first litter, and worst case scenario is you're going to be in a situation which means pup gets stuck, and both of their lives are threatened. And so I just said, right, I'm coming. Went down. There was one pup. They said his head's not that big and your best option now is to have a c-section so how did it all turn out in the end with the section it turned out really well mum's healing really nicely little boy's really happy um onwards and upwards if i can ask how much very really loosely have you spent so the stud fee was um 350 quid um, the first vet visit was 160, the caesarean was 1400 
and um, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> so you don't have to be a mathematician to know it's a non-profit organisation. <laughs> and so, so we're, we're talking loosely about two thousand pounds. So I'd love to love to meet him. He's beautiful. He's just stay there. Okay, awesome. This is the little man unnamed. <gasps> we haven't named him because he is officially for sale, but those conversations keep coming and going. <laughs> Do you want this to see the perfect. size of him? I would be absolutely thrilled. <gasps> oh my god. I mean word. he's two weeks old. Oh my wow. Huge. Look at this. He's outstanding. Isn't yeah. he? I mean, I know I'm biased, but he is outstandingly beautiful. So you brought Ginny home with the pup. How did she take to motherhood? We introduced them um, and she went for him. She picked him up by his tail and he, he squealed. Because she didn't deliver him, I think the bond was missing to start with. She'll lie on him. He'll squeal like a pig. But she won't then get up with that warning of he's uncomfortable mm. so you do have to be there so then to remove her off him we've had that quite a lot so it has been a, a fully hands-on job for yeah, yeah over two weeks now. i think it'll be another two weeks before you can leave them yeah a lot of work a lot of sleepless nights i won't recommend it for someone that likes their eight hours yeah a day. <laughs> if you were to give someone who wants to get into this one piece of Key advice, what would it be? Be prepared for every eventuality. <laughs> you can't think, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have a litter and make a profit. You know, don't put all your eggs in that basket. That might not be your situation. And if you've got no financial backup, don't even start. <laughs> Like Joe and Paul, many bully owners can face issues when breeding. For bullies and Frenchies, one of the main hereditary problems are the difficulties they face giving birth. French Bulldogs are 16 times more likely to suffer from complications. These dogs are often bred to have narrow hips and wide heads, which leaves puppies at risk of getting stuck on the way out. I'm off today to meet a vet in Burnley who handles a lot of these issues, usually with C-sections. Without intervention through caesarean sections, many puppies and mums wouldn't survive birth. Vet Francesca frequently helps these dogs in need. To avoid the risk associated with natural births, some owners and breeders choose to book elective C-sections. So the decision to have a C-section shouldn't be a light decision. There are risks involved and risks are mainly to mum. It's pink. The elective C-sections um, and even emergency C-sections are occurring more often. You usually sort of see one C-section, mm. two a year, um, but we are seeing them on a regular basis. Uh, certainly seeing at least three or four a week for owners or breeders. I think the fact that they can drop their dog off and know that they're in safe hands and then at the end of it they get their dog and a basket full of puppies, they think it's just been the easier option. There are some that would say that offering elective C-sections is actually part of the problem. How do you feel about that? Would agree to an extent. Um, yes, of course, we are just helping the breeds that are struggling um, produce more breeds that are struggling. Mm -hmm. But the way I see it is that Whilst there is still a demand for those breeds, people are going to supply them. And that's not something I think vets can stop. If every vet closed their doors to the people that are breeding the, those dogs, mm -hmm. um, you're forcing the breeders to go elsewhere yeah. um, and perhaps down routes that aren't legal, aren't mm -hmm. in the best interest of mum um, and aren't safe. At least you have a vet as part of the process. Yes. It's better to have a vet part of the process than yeah, not at all. Absolutely.
Emergency canine cesareans cost on average £2,000 and elective C-sections around £800. But the good news is that as a result of Francesca's expertise, all three pups were delivered safely. Two females and a male. It's not just during birth that dog owners are being hit with huge costs. The most popular breeds struggle with inbred health conditions, which means pet insurance for bullies, Frenchies and Dachshunds can cost anywhere from £30 up to £150 a month. And this often doesn't cover common hereditary issues. Owners without insurance can find themselves running up really big bills. Health problems and health conditions caused by things like inbreeding can cost a huge amount of money. And so I'm having a review of one of my clients who I've seen in the last six to 12 months who's had quite a bit of work done. It's an XL bully breed, less than four years old, but has had countless issues. Kidney issues, things related to nutrition, things related to skin problems, which is a, quite a common problem that we see in, in bully breeds. Tumours of the skin that we've removed several times. It's just a very grim, long history of back in, back out, back in, back out. When you have inbreeding and this pressure to create a dog that looks a certain way, this is the type of thing that you see more often. Pre-breeding medical checks are absolutely necessary to help avoid passing on hereditary health problems to puppies. It does make you think, what would be the reality if there wasn't so much of this inbreeding and overbreeding from the past? Would this dog be in a better position? Let's get a final total, shall we? Let's get this together. Wow, that's, a, that's quite a number. In the last three, three, three and a half years, we're looking at 10,000 pounds worth of specific problems. Not just boosters and all the extras, specific problems related to this particular breed. And uh, 8,000 pounds of that has been mostly within the last 18 months. And this dog is, is barely four years old. Just a huge amount of money. It's not just the financial side that we should be considering. These are real animals with real problems and real conditions that can affect them for the entirety of their lives. And this can be improved by better breeding and more educated breeding. The inherited health problems these popular breeds experience includes difficulties in conceiving naturally. Which is why artificial insemination of bullies and Frenchies has skyrocketed in popularity. Non-surgical AI doesn't have to be done by a vet. Semen is collected manually from a male dog and inserted into a female's vagina. There are lots of online videos about artificial insemination and the popularity of dogs that can't easily breed naturally has sparked a whole new industry of canine fertility clinics. Today, I'm meeting Rosie in Cheshire, who opened up her new business last year. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice Come to in. see you. I'm gonna squeeze by social distancing. <laughs> Why artificial insemination? People like to ship semen from all over the world now. So a stud dog has value beyond just the local area, is that right? Absolutely. What would you say to, I guess, other people who say it's not the best thing? I would say, you know, people still like to do natural ties. And that's absolutely fine. Mm. But I think in terms of safety, with a natural tie, you're taking a bit of a gamble. Really? Um, mm. And you're taking a bit of a gamble with um, the quality. Right. Whereas at least with this, we can see that before it goes in. Canine fertility clinics are still an incredibly new industry. Five years ago, there was only one in the country. Now estimates put the number at over 100 across the UK. 
and many experts are worried about this trend, particularly because there is no national regulating body that governs these clinics. Are we noticing that there is a financial drive for you know, certain, certain practices? You have to make your decisions for the, uh, based on the dog's welfare. Yeah. I don't think that always happens. Mm -hmm. You know, I could very easily take their money and say, it's okay, I'll, I'll do that AI for you. But knowing that it's not the right time to mate, mm -hmm. we won't get a litter. Mm -hmm. But do you know what? I could still take you 200 pounds. Yeah. Absolutely not. It has to be about the welfare of the dog. Um, and that needs to happen more within the industry. Are there any areas which you know sometimes could you know fall into veterinary you know related things? Definitely. Right. Um, and again, that's something I chose mm. um, not to do. I wanted to make sure that everything I did. Um, was above board, it yeah. was legal, mm -hmm. um, it was insurable, yeah. it was the right thing to do. Rosie is doing a semen analysis today. Who have we got here with us? We've got Jack and he is a very experienced stud dog. So we're now going to do a semen analysis. We're looking at, the, there's lots of sperm there. We're looking to see if there's any abnormalities. Yep. So that reading here, Fabian, is 264. Mm -hmm. And that's 200 million per mil. Yeah, there you go. Well done, Jack. Well done, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I do this all the time. <laughs> it's quite clear that Rosie is super passionate about what she does. And it's always refreshing to hear someone putting the dogs first. Animal welfare is top of the list. However, it does feel like there's another side to this emerging industry. Leisha, who I met at the Bully Meet, has also recently set up her own canine fertility business. Maybe she can tell me more. So this is where my little clinic is, just up Let's there. have a look. So you've got lots of different pieces of equipment here. Yes. Talk me through it. So all the pieces of equipment I've got so far is my blood machine, a yeah. progesterone machine. Yeah. This machine cost £2,500. Still a bit dear then. So you've got a centrifuge. So I've got a centrifuge that was only around for about 120 pounds yeah, and a semen count machine. Okay. That is also 2,500 pounds, I know. It's quite clear you spent a lot of money. It's a big investment, right? Yeah, big investment. And I feel like it should be big because I don't feel like people should just be doing it, like mm. just in their back gardens. And especially if they haven't got these machines, they haven't got like more of an indication as yes. like potentially having puppies. So they're mm. just constantly doing it like, no. God knows what they're, how many times they're breeding her, do you know what I mean? To hope that she has puppies. So this it's, is what you need yeah, to do it right. Yeah, this is what you need to do it right and to do it properly. And I feel like more people need to realise that. Leisha's also spent money on training courses. I've got to ask, how much did this all cost? On finance, I got five grand's worth of stuff. And then courses wise, um, the dog breeding course was, I think it was on offer, <laughs> so I got about £100 off. I think it meant to be 200 but I got it for £120. Um, the fertility course was £600. Um, the microchipping course was 120 and the ultrasound was 360 So, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you think this was something you wanted to get into? Obviously, the start of lockdown. Um, I'm a personal trainer and fitness instructor, so it all went out the window. <laughs> um, I had more time to think, um, obviously I love dogs anyway, had my dogs, um, so I thought about going into it and it's really hard being a young person, making money now, I want my own house, so I thought what better way to start a business. Where did you go first or what was the first decision? So I enrolled myself on a dog breeding course, it was all online because obviously with Covid, and ended up getting a distinction. <laughs> um, so I'd probably say that like motivated me more to go into it. So I was like, wow, like actually I'm good at this. <laughs> then I went on to do a fertility course, um, more practical. Obviously, just doing online courses, not going to be great with hands-on stuff. 
So I did three courses, um, all with a company called Smart Breeder. How did you find these courses? Do you think they set you up well? Um, going into the courses, yes, they gave me so much information. Um, during the courses, they taught us how to take blood, but told us that we're not actually legally allowed to get the blood. Um, they said there's a really grey area on it, there's no right or wrong answer on it. It's interesting that they are saying it's a grey area because I know it's very black and white. You definitely can't. <laughs> That's what vets yeah. are supposed to do. How did that make you feel about the whole thing? Now I'm just a bit uneasy about everything. I feel like if they're going to say things like that, people could go home and maybe teach other people. And that's obviously not, that's not good. I've put a lot of money into it. I don't want to get shut down because the course I did has taught me wrong. Because that won't be fair on me. I paid for that course. Um, so I think it's important I do always keep researching and keep up to date with the current standards. It's clear Leisha wants to run things properly at her clinic, but I'm worried about what people like her are being taught. Searching online, I can see there are about five companies offering training in canine fertility in the UK, and the course Leisha went on is run by the biggest, Smart Breeder. The course Leisha attended is advertised as being covered by a fully qualified veterinary surgeon and is taught by Dave Holt who the company promoted online, but who is not a registered vet or a veterinary nurse. As with clinics, there's currently no national regulatory body for canine fertility training courses. I'm really worried about everything I've heard, so to confirm exactly what is being taught, an undercover reporter has agreed to attend and secretly film Smart Breeders Canine Fertility course. Just as we'd been warned, Dave Holt shows all the amateurs how to take blood from dogs, even though each person doing the course has to sign Smart Breeder's own terms and conditions, which acknowledges in writing that blood should only be taken by a vet or a veterinary nurse. Our undercover reporter also recorded other really worrying scenes. So again, a little bit of leave on the stroke. I'm really concerned and want a second opinion. So I'm taking the footage to show a senior vet and expert in dog breeding called Mike Jessup. Needles, 16 mil, 21 gauge in green. You okay. can't cause any damage with that needle. Completely wrong to say you can't cause any damage with that. You, you, needles are dangerous items and they will cause damage running close to that vein down the leg is also an associated nerve and an associated artery. Now, if it hit that nerve and, and damaged that nerve, he could have led to paralysis of that dog's leg. Make sure it's on nice and tight. Again, the only way you can cause damage is if you push the air into the vein. That's really close to that, What am I going to do? He's holding the syringe in his mouth. He's handling sterile equipment. So he's now contaminated all that sterile equipment. It's incredible that he is brazenly saying that to a group of people who've probably never held a syringe or a needle in their lives. It's just, it just blows my mind. So taking blood samples is crossing the line. People who've paid money to come along to this course in the belief that this is some sort of accredited, respected course, are being taught illegal practice. But you're not meant to do that. Take the blood. You want to cause me some problems? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm only kidding. No, you're not supposed to. And he's making plenty of reference to the fact that he shouldn't be doing this, and yet here he is training a whole group of people on exactly what he tells them they shouldn't be doing. It just doesn't make any sense. 
Mike confirms a serious animal welfare offence has been committed by Dave Holt, who goes on to advocate the illegal use of certain hormones to maximise the chances of larger litters. This is a real concern. Absolutely illegal. That's breaking all sorts of laws from Vet Resurgence Act to medicine laws. The best thing to do, you can even go to the vets and pay 87 quid, I think it is, a jab every day. Forget the name of it, oh, the mini, mini pill. One tablet a day. The pill I get from the doctor, from a, you mean from a girlfriend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, the mini pill, from, from a, so I could use that. No perception yeah. pill, yeah. Two weeks after the first week, and if it's dropping again, I've only told you, I've not told you to do it because again it won't be licensed for dogs. Here we have someone advocating the use of unlicensed products, human products, for use in the dog when no one knows what the long-term consequences of that would be or even what the short-term consequences would be. He shouldn't be playing around as though medicines and these potent drugs are some sort of sweeties that he can drop in and alter nature as he wants to. This evidence has been reported to all the relevant authorities for further investigation. Smart Breeder disputed our findings but did not give us a statement. They did, however, tell us that Dave Holt provides the canine fertility course through his own business. Mr Holt did not respond to our request for comment. It's clear we've uncovered some serious animal welfare issues and I can't ignore the warnings of the experts and the dog owners I've met. I need to take my findings straight to the top, to the government's chief veterinary officer, Christine Middlemiss. She has the power to recommend new policies and regulations, so I'm hoping she'll agree the dog breeding world needs some changes. We filmed one canine fertility course, which shows ordinary people attending both how to take blood from dogs and how to feed their dogs a human contraceptive pill. What do you think of that? It sounds a bit like um, illegal activities are already happening and we need to follow up on that because that is absolutely not acceptable. We have rules in place so that only appropriately trained and authorised people undertake activities um, and so um, we will be looking at that. And if we find that the rules are not strong enough um, or you know, um, don't cover enough of the activities and things, then yes, we'll make a recommendation to ministers that we should tighten up on them. This is music to my ears. While making this programme, the government announced a new action plan for animal welfare. It aims to increase the minimum age limit of puppies being imported into the UK. We can change that minimum age um, as we want to. It needs to be evidence-based. We need to do it with a science basis and not just make it up. Um, and absolutely, we will be looking at that. Brilliant. The government plan also details a ban on the importation of puppies with cropped ears. Ear cropping in this country is illegal and has been for a number of years. Mm -hmm. It's not, I, it, I don't think it should be a practice that's tolerated anywhere. So we're looking at um, how we can um, put in import conditions around that. And we've recently increased the um, time you can be put in jail for it, because it used to be a maximum of six months and it can go up to five years for any animal welfare offence. I couldn't be happier. There is going to be an open and frank conversation with the relevant bodies and the government to see if new legislation and regulation is needed. This has been a real eye-opener of a journey, but despite the shocking revelations, I've met so many dog lovers along the way who've renewed my faith that most owners want what's best for our canine friends. But it's also made me realise that we all need to pay attention to the many risks of buying and breeding so we can live up to our reputation as a nation of dog lovers.
there is one last stop I've got to make. I'm going to see Aaron and Freya, who've been searching for their puppy love, to find out how they've got on. Hello. Hi, right. Hello. Hello. How are you? Yeah, good, good, thank good, you. Good. Yes, what? that'd be lovely. So you've been on this this big journey now. Give me a recap of what has been, you know, an important part of this learning process. I think definitely seeing both sides. So like. Um, the buy-in and what to look for mm -hmm. in breeders, as well as sort of, I guess, the nasty side of breeding that can happen with the rescues. They have to deal with um, mm -hmm. that side for when people don't quite get it right. Mm -hmm. I think it's all been fantastic. Um, a lot of it isn't, even though we've been on this journey uh, for Dachshunds, a lot of it is transferable. Right. What's the next step for you guys? We did actually fill out an, an application of the RSPCA <sighs> yeah. and sent it off. Yeah. Um, we've actually been accepted. <gasps> Exciting! Um, for a fostering position. <gasps> yes. Was it a dachshund? It actually wasn't, no. Okay. He is a poodle cross, okay. and um, we are still absolutely in love with dachshunds, but I think. Maybe it, one day. <laughs> <laughs> the one that they've matched us up with is a smaller breed as well, yeah. so it, it, it is a perfect match in a, in a different way. What? Is the time scale? Is it weeks? Is it days? Is it months? Um, it's actually seconds. He's yeah. already inside. What? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're keeping a bit of a secret. <laughs> so, would you like to come through? Yes. And meet <laughs> come on, follow me. This way. So, this is Trico. He's here in the corner. Ah, oh, hello. Unfortunately, we can't uh, show him on camera um, as he's still part of an uh, RSPCA. Um, investigation. So it's looking like we'll probably be fostering for at least about six months. It's not really known. Um, the plus side of fostering is that financially RSPCA cover everything like vet bills, food, and obviously that's helpful. A, a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the downside is that there is a small chance that mm. if they didn't win the case that mm. we'd have to give him back. But that that is a really small chance. Mm. Um, so we're hoping that we will get to keep him. Yeah. Uh, you, you've already fallen in love, haven't you, Freya? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, me too. <laughs> Would you like to give him a look? Obviously, you don't even need to fi finish that, that question. <laughs> You'll have to get him quick. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be quick. <laughs> oh, no! Absolute floof. This has made my day. You are so chill. Hmm? I am over the moon for Aaron and Freya. They are fostering from the RSPCA, and I just think that is the best situation for them. And it just goes to show, if you take your time and you do the research, you can have a wonderful outcome.